Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Minimalist Podcast, where we discuss what it means to live a meaningful life with less. My name is Joshua Fields Milburn. And I'm Ryan Nicodemus. And together, we are the Minimalists. Get the TikTok machine ready, Danny Unknown. <laughs> Did we buy one of those? <laughs> <laughs> I think it's just his iPhone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Ryan, people frequently visit places like the Container Store to purchase clutter coffins mm. to hide their hoards. But the best way to organize your stuff isn't to store it in a basement mausoleum. The best way to organize is to get rid of of the excess stuff. Today on the public podcast, we're going to discuss America's obsession with storing useless stuff. Mm. Then this Thursday on the Minimalist Private Podcast, Ryan and I are going to record an episode about the kind of spring cleaning that works all year long. Mm. You can check that out at patreon.com slash the minimalists. Your support keeps our podcast and YouTube channel 100% advertisement free. Because advertisements suck. All right, y'all. Our first question of the day is from Kathy on Patreon. Can we talk about the rise of the storage business? <laughs> I mean, the what a rise. Broad, what a broad question. It, every year rises. It's been, I mean, right. I, I uh, since probably post-industrial age, I'm assuming like that's when it's really started to just get worse and worse year over year. It has continued. I mean, and here's the weird thing. And we're going to go into some stats here in a moment. This is a uniquely American problem. Yeah. We have more storage. We have more storage uh, facilities like square foot wise than we do homes. Correct. We have more storage facilities than the rest of the world combined. Dude, you know how many that is? It's over 52,000 storage facilities over over uh, across the country, which is more than six times the number of Starbucks. That is. Um, <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> and there are a lot of Starbucks in this country. Yes. In fact, maybe we could turn the Starbucks into storage facilities. Or. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, so uh, to answer Kathy's question here, <laughs> by the way, Kathy, thank you for being a patron. Yeah. You keep the podcast advertisement free. I have 63 self-storage industry statistics and trends for 2022. Mm. And so I'm mm. not going to read all 63 of these stats for you here. Just give us the, the juicy ones. The first one here is the global self-storage market was valued at $48 billion in 2020. We got in the wrong business, Milburn. We're talking people out of their stuff. We should have got into the business of helping people hoard their stuff. We could have done both. <laughs> Get it out of your home and put it into storage. <laughs> then you'll be happy. Right. It's, it always cracks me up when I see a lot of these storage places will, you know, like the big storage places, they have social media accounts and they'll often share our documentaries oh. from Netflix encouraging people to declutter their stuff, but not to let go of it. Yeah. To simply pay them money to hold on to it for them. Mm. But of course, if you're letting go of it physically, but storing it, you're not, A, you're not even letting go of it physically, but B, it's still weighing on the back of your mind. It's taking up space. Yeah. And it's also extracting resources mm. out of your bank account. Yeah. Here's one for you. Over 88% of renters are between the ages of 21 and 55. Oh, that was shocking to me. That is shocking. I would think it would be more of a like fifty to eighty, like you know, because that's near the end of your of, of your life, or you're 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 a lot of the way through your life, I should say. Yes, and you've collected so many things, but that statistic tells me that at about fifty, mm -hmm. people start to realize why am I holding on to all this stuff, or. At around age 55, people say, why am I paying for all the storage? I'll just hoard right. this stuff in my house. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Remember, Ryan, I had a two and a half car garage. Mm -hmm. I don't even know what that means. What <laughs> the hell is a half a car? <laughs> but what it really means is, oh, there's enough space this in here to store all of my junk. Yeah. And so we're going to talk about why this is a problem. Here's one other very unique stat. And this is why I say it's a uniquely... American problem. I didn't mean to say very unique. No, nothing can be very unique. It's either unique or it isn't unique. Uh, but anyway, this is a uniquely American problem because more than 90% of the self-storage industry is in the United States. Now, quite often, clutter and the inability to let go, these aren't American problems. They're worldwide problems. But we have found a new way to hide our clutter. That's why I opened the show talking about clutter coffins. Clutter coffins, 
Yeah, I got this idea because I, I saw an advertisement. I was walking down the street. It was like a little billboard on a bench that was advertising coffins. And I saw it was a very cluttered ad. Oh, I'm spilling coffee on myself. It was a very cluttered ad. Man, only in LA what? would you have a, a billboard or a yeah an advertisement for coffins. Yeah, right. <laughs> it's a very strange thing, it right? Is, it is, yeah. And, and in fact, I, I feel like I would see something like that in the Midwest, but no, I saw it here. Mm -hmm. Anyway, it was an advertisement for coffins, and it was a very cluttered ad. And I'm like, oh, cluttered coffins. Wait a minute. <laughs> clutter coffins yeah that's really what we're doing when we go to the container store or walmart or target we mm -hmm. buy these plastic bins malabama's getting me a, a paper towel thank you malabama yes like especially with the storage units like it's the um so the clutter coffins is are the storage uh, uh the storage rubber storage containers you put underneath your bed where the actual uh storage facility is is it called a mausoleum like what is it called when you have like the big tomb yes that's a mausoleum it's a mausoleum yes okay that's yeah. like the yeah that's and so the we've, mausoleum of the clutter coffins right yeah. we've turned our homes into mausoleums or our basements our attics our walk-in closets our spare bedrooms these are just mausoleums and then we have all these little individual clutter coffins mm -hmm. right and we treat it as though oh this will solve my problem my problem is i'm not organized enough mm -hmm. well no i can tell you from firsthand experience my problem was that I was too organized mm. and I wasn't willing to let go of anything. Here you go, Alabama. Thank mm. you. Yeah, oh. it's interesting because I think storage units, they have their, they do have their function. They do have their place. Like I use as a minimalist, like I had a storage unit for like six months uh, when, when we moved out to Montana. Because Bleep that out, Sean. <laughs> 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 I'm like, wait, what did I say? We'll be ruined. We'll be ruined. <laughs> yeah. So when we moved out to Montana, I had a storage unit uh, because I didn't think we would be out in Montana as long as we were. So I had a bunch of stuff in my apartment. I was like, I'm going to a washer and dryer and um, just some other things, a chair. Uh, it was the smallest storage unit they had available. Mm -hmm. Put my stuff in there. And turns out we were in Montana longer than six months. But right. that was my... That was my uh, limit. I was like, if we're out there longer than six months, I'm going to get rid of that storage unit and get rid of my stuff. So I, um, yeah, we went back to Ohio. I had a, a yard sale. Actually, it was more like a um, a storage sale. I just literally put an ad in the paper. Hey, here's my storage unit number. Come out and buy some stuff. <laughs> Everything must go. That's like a setup. Yeah, I know, right? Yeah, I, I, I'm, you, someone might get killed in a scenario. Like, you gotta be <laughs> right. really careful. Yeah, but, it, uh, but yeah, it was great, man. People came, I got rid of all my stuff and then I got rid of the storage unit. So, you know, in that situation, it was totally useful for me. It it served a purpose. Yes. Um, I know that when you were kind of in between places in LA, you had the um, what is it called? The whatever it is, the mobile pod. I forget yes. what they call it. Yeah. And so I didn't. I was I was homeless for a short period of time. Right. Yeah. I was home full, as Colin would say. <laughs> I no. I we were moving, and I and there was a uh, there was an overlap between the two places we were going to be in. So it was a couple weeks where we needed a place to put our things, our couch our bed, yeah. et cetera, right. until I had the opportunity to move it into our new apartment when the current tenants moved out, right? Yeah. And so I think that's a great point, Ryan. I'm not, I don't want to renounce storage. There is certainly a place for it. And the same thing is true even with these clutter coffins, with sure. storage containers. In yeah. fact, Malabama, we could use a few of them. So maybe I'm going to get Malabama to go down and buy three storage containers okay, for Okay, now, us. Sean, you really do have to bleep that out. <laughs> <laughs> and, and here's why. like When we go down to... Uh, we have a closet downstairs. Or an we call it the annex. And it's basically where we keep extra cables and, and things for the studio. And right now we do it in like uh, these ugly cardboard boxes mm. that are just random boxes and is there a better way to stack and store the things that we know we use regularly but mm. don't want cluttering up the space yes absolutely yes and we could have a few storage containers for that mm -hmm. without it being a problem because as soon as you renounce something you're forever tethered to it amen so i'm not saying get rid of storage containers i'm not saying get rid of storage facilities the problem is when we rely on these things to hide our problem, yeah. when they become part of the problem mm -hmm. and they masquerade as though they're the solution. Well, a lot of the times it's the easy solution. What do I do with all my stuff? Well, I'll just out of sight, out of mind. I'll pay for a storage unit, put it all in there. It's much more difficult to actually go through your stuff, to to sell it, to figure out what to donate, to figure out what needs what needs to be recycled. Um, it's yeah, it's it's a it's a quick fix for a lot of reasons, I think. Right, and it just hides the problem. Right. It's punting in a way, yeah. 
but you're punting to yourself and you're still going to have to pick this thing back up. Mm -hmm. And it's punting in the sense that it puts you way, way back from where you want to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, if you want to store your things temporarily because it makes sense. Great. Wonderful. But if there isn't an end date, or if there isn't a plan in place and I'm just going to hold on to this, mm. it's just a different type of clinging. It's extending your parameter of yeah. clinging. I wonder how many people here uh, listening to this have a storage uh, unit with, uh, you know, however fil filled it is, how much they've spent on that over the last year, two years, three years, four years, five years versus how much their stuff is actually worth. Ooh, yeah. Go to the YouTube video. Let us know how much have you been spending on storage lockers that you don't access regularly. Mm -hmm. And when I say regularly, you're not going there at least once a month. Yeah. Right. And again, if you have some sort of end date, I need to store this stuff for six months. It totally makes sense because it would make more sense to do that than to go out and buy all new things and be incredibly wasteful. Right. The problem is the story that we often tell ourselves is what? Oh, it'd be wasteful for me to let go of these things. I might need them someday. Mm. And then someday never arrives. Someday yeah. is not a day of the week. It's not a day of the year. It's some hypothetical day in the future. And so we hold on to it for someday. Someday doesn't arrive, but I'm holding on to it. Why? Just in case. Go back and watch our just in case uh, episode as well. We did a whole episode on just in case items, and many of the items that end up in these storage facilities are just in case items. Here's a few more stats for you, Ryan. This one was, I don't know if it was shocking, but I don't know what I, I didn't really have an expectation here. So, approximately 65% of self storage renters are women, but almost 90% of people moving into the self storage unit are men. So like it seems that the women are all in a and this could often be in a marriage perhaps mm. are the ones who are renting the space or using the space mm -hmm. but then they're asking their husbands or brothers or fathers to move the stuff into the oh. hey can you move my hoard for me and, and I know because I used to ask Ryan to help me move my hoard around this makes me yeah it makes me think about your mom's hoard yeah when she was moving down to Florida and she had that storage unit and uh yeah we were helping the movers with all her stuff yeah that was man yeah that was fun <laughs> <laughs> and that's the thing it's actually never fun no whenever you're dealing with all of these things and this is why ryan did his packing party 12 years ago mm. oh my god <laughs> You were, it was 12 years ago that you did this packing party because you knew we knew when we came up with this idea oh this is the one time you have to confront all of your things when mm. you have to move it. And so no one ever goes to their storage locker when they're moving stuff out and saying, I wish I would have stored more things that mm. I need to, to move. Yeah. I, I wish I would have held on to more useless junk. No one ever says, I wish I had more stuff that isn't adding value to my life. No one ever says, I need more non-essential items mm. in my life. No one ever stops and says, please, please give me more junk. Give me the capacity to hold more junk in these clutter coffins, in these mausoleums of stuff. And so We've got, oh, actually, you know what, Podcast Sean, put a link to this article in the show notes. There are 63 different stats if you want to read more of them. Uh, Gen X is the generation. So that's often we're, we're, we're cuspers, but Gen yeah. X are the, is the generation who's storing the most stuff right now. Oh, really? Yes. Interesting. And also, here was one other one. Here's how you know, well, here's why you know there are so many storage facilities popping up everywhere. Hmm. As you said, more than six times the number of Starbucks. Yeah. Because their profit margin is 41%. The entire industry. So that means some of them, their profit margin is excess of 100%. So a grocery store that is doing phenomenal, their profit margin single digits. Mm. Five, six, seven, eight, nine percent if you're a grocery store is doing really well, maybe you make 10%. Mm. Storage facilities, their profit margin is 41%. Wow. And so they're making a ton of money renting out all of this space to you. And in a way, they're sort of taking advantage of you because they're taking advantage of your desire to cling. Mm. They're taking advantage of, the, of what they know. Americans in particular, human beings, 
aren't capable of letting go anymore. Now, we have been capable for millions of years. And you see it in children. They let go so easily. My daughter's dog died this weekend. Oh. Yeah, it was super sad. Yeah. yeah. He was um, like 14 years old, right? Mm. And so it wasn't unexpected. He's been going downhill for the last year or so. And um, she was super, super sad on Sunday and then on, on Saturday. And then on Sunday, she went ice skating. And mm. I have a picture of her with the biggest, most beautiful look on her face. And there was a mourning period. There was a lamenting there. She's not a sociopath. She didn't laugh at the dog dying, obviously. She was very saddened by it. But she was also able to let it go. And I think if she was three years old, she would have even had an easier time to let go. She's eight now, almost nine. And so we cling. We cling to the way we wish things were. We cling to the past. In fact, Ryan, there's this, uh, we always talk about being in the moment or being present, right? Mm -hmm. That's really just a boutique way of saying Stop clinging to the past. Mm. Stop clinging to the outcome of something that might happen in the future. Yeah. That's the only way to be in the moment is to not cling to the past, mm. to not cling to the future. Because if we're not doing those things, then we are actually being in the moment. However, these clutter coffins, these storage lockers, they're just another way for us to cling to the past, the artifacts of the past, the signifiers of the past, or they're a way for us to cling to our idealized version of the future. If I just have all of the right things at the right time in the right sequence in the right house in the right town, mm. then I'll be complete. Then I'll be happy. Mm. It doesn't work out that way, though. No. Kathy, thank you so much for your question. Let's move on to our callers here. If you have a question or comment for our podcast, 406-219-7839 or email a voice memo to podcast at theminimalists.com. Looks like we have a question here from Catherine in Ontario, Canada. Ever since I was pregnant with my daughter, I've been trying to minimize the things that I own. At the time, I was not only receiving a lot of things for my daughter, but I was also realizing that someday the things that I own will go to her. I, it has definitely been an ongoing process. However, since that time, I have found it hard to continue doing something that I have always found value in, scrapbooking. I now see that scrapbooking will in turn create books of photos that will someday be left to my daughter to decide what to do with. Ever since high school, I have loved scrapbooking. I feel like I have always been very conscious of limiting the amount of su scrapbooking supplies that I own. I create pages that do not have too many embellishments. Since I am a graphic designer and photographer, Scrapbooking is a relaxing, creative outlet that helps me organize my thoughts and memories into something that I get joy out of looking at in the years to come. For me, scrapbooking has meant keeping memorabilia like cards and ticket stubs from events that I have experienced and then incorporating them with photos to create a designed journal of my life. Since I have been scrapbooking since 1997, I have 11 12 by 12 books. I haven't been able to continue scrapbooking since 2017 with this looming knowledge that in another 20 years there could possibly be 22 books in total. I have also been reading Zero Waste Home by Bea Johnson, which makes me feel very aware of the things I throw in the garbage, such as photograph scraps. I wanted your advice since I actually get a lot of joy out of not only creating them, but looking at them. I know that you have in the past given advice to display your photos in digital frames and carefully selected artwork around your home, However, in this situation, I feel like the act of creating something that is tactile and can be flipped through later is part of what I enjoy. I've been feeling a little stuck ever since I stopped scrapbooking, and I look forward to hearing your response. You know, Catherine, uh, Josh and I, what we try to help people do is set boundaries up for themselves. And, you know, Josh and I could sit here and give you some tips on, well, you know, uh, um, how, limited to how many books you have, limited to how many pages. I mean, we could sit here and suggest some boundaries, but really, Catherine, it's up to you to set the boundaries. So she stopped scrapbooking because she wanted to be a minimalist, essentially. That's the most upsetting part of it. It really to me. is because it it brought her joy. It yeah. brought her uh, um, a sense of purpose. It was it was an art, really. And yeah, for someone to stop their art because they want to be a minimalist, yeah, that is really sad. This is the unfortunate side of legalism or mm. rules, right? Restrictive rules. Now, sometimes temporarily setting up some rules will help you find your boundaries, right? Mm -hmm. Your healthy boundaries, the boundaries that help you thrive and be more creative. Catherine, this is a creative act, what you're doing. Yeah. And if you had 22 scrapbooks 20 years from now or whatever it might be, 
that could be a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. You are creating art. You're an artist. Mm -hmm. And the last thing I want to do is tell you to stop doing it because you read some zero waste book that discouraged you from producing any waste whatsoever. This isn't waste. Mm. Yes, there are byproducts of what you're creating. You may not be able to use everything you create. Just like I'm a writer, right? And so when I write a novel and it's 200,000 words, but you publish 60,000 words, mm -hmm. there's some waste there. And actually, some yeah. of it is actual physical paper. I print out things. I write longhand sometimes. And so when I write, I am producing a little bit of waste. Yeah. But if, if it meant hey, you have to stop writing because you can't produce any waste whatsoever. And are there ways to display, display these things digitally? Yes, but if it's not giving you that same fuel, that same aliveness, that, that feeling of being who you are. So, mm -hmm. Catherine, I want to communicate something important to you here. I know you're worried about, okay, years from now, I might have to pass these on to my daughter and she may not get value from these. That might be true, mm -hmm. but you are not creating these for your daughter. If you were simply and solely creating these for your daughter, I would say, oh, pause, but she want these, mm -hmm. but this is for you. Now, if your daughter ends up getting value from them a year from now, a decade from now, two decades from now, mm -hmm. wonderful. That is a bonus, but you're doing this to create art right now and I applaud you for that. Yeah. And it's not that you need my permission or Ryan's permission to keep doing this, but it would be really, really unfortunate yeah. to stop producing the art that makes you feel alive. Let's talk about the zero waste thing for a second. I, I, I First off, I admire anyone who is trying to live a zero waste lifestyle. I admire someone who is environmentally conscious to the point of every single second of every single day they're trying to produce as little waste as possible i that's very admirable the zero waste movement though is a little it's a little um well maybe it's kind of like minimalism right like once you call yourself something like you're steeped in irony mm -hmm. but like the zero waste movement if you're using electricity there's waste involved with that mm -hmm. if you're using water there's waste involved with that yes um, th there's always going to be a little bit of waste. So th the reason why I'm bringing this up, this isn't to put down the zero waste movement as much as to say, hey, look, it's not a matter of if you're creating waste. It's how much waste are you creating and why are you creating it? That, what a great question. And that, Catherine, uh, is how I would approach the scrapbooking thing is, is ask yourself that question. Like, why do you want to create this waste? Well, you want to create art. Mm -hmm. You want to bring yourself some joy. You want to bring yourself some purpose. And that's great. That's a good reason to uh, create a little bit of scrapbook wasting. Now, if her passion was, I don't know, changing oil and dumping it down the gutters in the street, I would probably say, okay, Catherine, maybe you don't want to do that. <laughs> There's a pretty big environmental cost with that. Right. But if her passion was changing oil in a way that produced as little waste as possible, yeah. that might actually be a wonderful thing for the world. Totally. Right. And so you're creating something right now. It might produce a little bit of quote unquote waste, but what you're doing is not wasted. A person who pursues art in its purest form, I applaud that person. Mm -hmm. I pat them on the back. I hold them up as an example of the way that many of us want to be because art often gets ruined by what? Commerce. Mm. Oh, check out this ad that I'm putting on my. TV show or podcast or magazine or whatever it might be, yeah. art gets ruined by commerce. Mm. What you're doing here doesn't have a commercial aspect. Not that it would be evil if it did, right? But Catherine, you're doing something that is pure. Mm. And yes, it might you might throw away a few pieces of paper every now and then. Mm. I'm not going to worry about that at all. And by the way, if you end up with 22 scrapbooks, that's not the real problem. If the average American household has 300,000 items in it and you have 22 scrapbooks, that's not even a drop in the bucket. If you're being intentional in all these other areas of life, think about how much less waste you are producing. And yes, you'll be intentional in this area as well. You're not going to pour heaps of waste out of your scrapbooking into a dump site, but mm -hmm. you might have a few little scraps here and there. And by definitions, that's what scrapbooking is. Yeah. But also by definition, scrapbooking means you're taking some scraps, things that might otherwise be waste, 
and you're turning it into art. How pure is that? Mm. Catherine, I'd love to send you a copy of our book, Everything That Remains. Ryan and I moved to a cabin in the middle of nowhere a decade ago, and uh, there was one traffic light in 3,400 square miles, and we wrote (laughs) the first draft of this book. It's called Everything That Remains, and it's one of our favorite things that we've ever done. If you like our podcast, you'll enjoy the audiobook version of Everything That Remains, or if you want the book book or the ebook version, it is a book that is really about us letting go. There's an entire chapter in there of me dealing with my mom's excess stuff and much of her waste and, and trying to sort through what is essential, what is junk, mm. what is value adding, what might augment my life, what would I like to hold on to, and what do I need to let go of. Enjoy that copy of Everything That Remains. Alabama, do we have any questions from our live stream? Shout out to our patrons on the live stream. Yeah. We do. We have a question from Raquel. What are the origins of spring cleaning? Where did we get started with that? Hmm. You know what? I want to talk about the origins of spring cleaning on the Maximal episode because I'm going to dive deep into the origins of spring cleaning. I think a lot of us don't really understand where that comes from. Yeah. And I want to talk about how we can implement spring cleaning like a year long or (laughs) all year round spring cleaning Yeah. so that we're not overwhelmed in the spring. How about one more question from the live stream? This one is from Arbry. My wife and I have about 20 boxes of clothes in a storage place for our future child but we clearly have too much. How can we approach this if we're not sure what we'll need? Mm. You're going to name the kid Fashionista. <laughs> <laughs> Minimalista. Yeah, uh, my daughter's eight. And she, uh, when I, I asked her, I don't know, maybe six months or so ago, what she wants to be when she grows up. Just, uh, are there any professions? And she said, I want to be a fashionista. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I don't really. I'm like, what does a fashionista do? She, she's like, I don't really know. <laughs> and. I think we often hold on to those things because we assume they're going to be useful. Yeah. It's so hypothetical. That's the ultimate just in case item. Mm -hmm. We have a minimalist rule book. You can find it at theminimalists.com slash rule book. It's free. You can download it. There's 16 rules for living with less. But Ryan, they're just boundaries, really. And these rules are extremely adjustable. Two of the rules in there. One's the just in case rule. Anything Mm -hmm. that I'm holding on to just in case I can let go of because I can replace it for less than twenty dollars in less than twenty minutes wherever I'm wherever I am. That's certainly true with kids' clothes because mm. kids' clothes are almost free if you go to any swap meet or um, a secondhand store. Yeah, you can find kids' clothes for nothing on Craigslist, right? Yes. So you're spending money. You're spending more than nothing right now to hold on to clothes that are worth essentially nothing. The other rule that really came to mind is the just for when uh, items rule. And so just for when is different from just in case items. Just for when items are items you're holding on to that you know you're certain you will use. These don't fall in that category. Right now, you are uncertain as to how much of these you will use, Mm. when you will use them. You're like, my toilet paper is a just for when item. Sure. I'm certain I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. I hope I don't have to use it all today. (laughs) But it will come in handy. And Mm -hmm. I don't want to run out. So I'm like, "Uh uh-oh, when I need it, I don't want to have to run to the store immediately. Yeah. Because that would be a messy trip to the store. And so, yes, I do have some toilet paper on hand. But I didn't hold on to Ella's clothes in case we might have some other kid in the future. I decided to let go of those things. Why? Because if I stop clinging to it, someone else could get value from those things. But if I lock them up in those clutter coffins, in a storage mausoleum, no one is ever going to get any value from those things as I cling to that hoard. Mm. Man, uh, the, the reason why people let go of things, the reason why I started to let go of things was because I had a lot of angst. Like I had some pain that I had to address. And it sounds like uh, this gentleman has some pain that he needs to address. So uh, yes, I, I like setting up the different boundaries. Maybe you keep two boxes instead of 22 boxes, whatever it is. But my favorite boundary or my favorite rule to apply to this is the spontaneous combustion rule. Ooh. So you ask yourself, if all of those children's clothes, if they spontaneously combusted, how would I feel right now? And if you would feel relief, then let those go, man. 
But if you would feel pain and stress and, and angst and, oh my God, I got to go out and replace 22 boxes of clothes and hold on to them. But I, I'm willing to bet that uh, you probably feel a little bit of relief. Or maybe ask yourself if half the box is spontaneously combusted. And what the beautiful thing about that is if you would feel relief, you actually get to pick the, the, the half of those boxes that do spontaneously combust. <laughs> you could TikTok that, Danny. Ryan, what time you got? You know what time it is, Josh. It's time for the lightning round where we answer your text messages. You can text your questions, your comments, your smart remarks to 937 202 4654. Even your eggplant emojis. <laughs> we get quite a few of those. <laughs> those texts literally go to both of our phones and we respond to as many people as we can. Uh, in fact, uh, yeah, you can just text us 937 202 4654 and we interact with you there. But we also answer some questions here during the lightning round via those text messages. Was it the text message that. Um Someone just uh, tweeted or texted us from Ukraine and they were talking about how uh, they were listening to our podcast because they, because of the situation that's going on there, mm -hmm. like they had to get up and go. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of stressing about what do I bring? What do I need? What? Uh, yeah. And um, yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, just being able to have communications like that via text is unbelievable. Yes, indeed. It's now, inspiring. Now, during the lightning rounds, where Ryan and I do our best to answer questions with a short, shareable, less than 140 character response. We put the text to these minimal maxims in the show notes so you can copy and share our pithy answers on social media if you like. And now you can find all of our minimal maxims in one place, minimalmaxims.com. Alabama, looks like we have a question here from Kelsey. How do you determine which things are worth storing? Mm. Hmm. Here's a here's a pithy answer for you. Then we'll unpack it. This is an oldie but a goodie, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Organizing is well planned hoarding. Yeah. Every time we organize something, what we're really doing is organizing our hoard. So of course, the best way to organize your stuff is to get rid of most of it. Yeah. And so. Kelsey, the way that you do that is by looking at the things that you know you can let go of. It's starting somewhere. You can start with something like the 30-day minimalism game. You can download our free calendar on our website, theminimalists.com slash game. You can partner up with someone, and it'll give you that momentum you need to let go of the excess stuff. Because if you have a lot of things, like most people do... Mm -hmm. You'll know right away some of these things. I know I can get rid of one thing today, right? Mm. And tomorrow I know I can get rid of two things. And the next day I know I can get rid of three things. That's how the minimalism game works. And by day 10, you're getting rid of 10 things and you're getting that momentum to let go. You're not getting rid of the things that are important to you, the things that add value to your life. You're getting rid of the things that are in the way. So it's not about holding on to the things that add value first. It's about eliminating the things you know are in the way. Amen. Understanding the why will help you better understand the what and the how. Yes. So it's not how do you determine which things are worth storing. It's why are you asking this question? Mm -hmm. Is it because you want to be freer? You want to be lighter? You want to be more mobile? You want to be able to turn your life around on a dime? Like once you understand the why, the how, and the what really kind of uh, uncovers itself. Absolutely. Because when you understand that why... Then the what, the things, mm -hmm. they support that why. Yeah. We try to back into a why. Well, right. I'm going to hold on to these 100,000 items. Yeah. But they may not help you get to the why. Mm. In fact, they might get in the way of your why. Yeah. Malaban, we got a whole bunch more to talk about. But first, real quick, for right here, right now, here's one thing that's going on in the life of the minimalist. You know, the folks over at Cameo, they've been asking us to, to join Cameo so we can charge people to make videos for, you know, whatever. And, and we decided not to do that. We, we didn't want to do it. But we can't just randomly make a bunch of videos every single day for folks. So mm -hmm. we have a tier of people on our Patreon where... For no additional charge, if you're part of that tier, you get a whole bunch of other things as well. It's called the VIP tier. It's limited to 250 people. Mm -hmm. We'll send you a personalized video. So if you want to celebrate your wife's birthday or your husband's bar mitzvah or whatever it is, um, we will send a video congratulating you, whatever. It's all part of what the, the regular tier. So we're not going to charge you money for those videos. If you are one of our VIP patrons, you can get a video, a custom video from me and Ryan. We'll say whatever you want in any language you want. <laughs> 
as long as it's English. Yeah, <laughs> husband's bar mitzvah isn't a bar mitzvah like when a, a, a boy becomes a man at like thirteen. <laughs> yes, that's why it was funny. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I love jokes. They're they are funny. <laughs> His favorite jokes are are funny ones. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I don't like the not funny ones. Yeah, me either. Yeah. And neither does my daughter. Although she doesn't think anything I say is funny, unfortunately. <laughs> Occasionally, I'll throw a dad joke in there, and she's uh, the one I told her recently. Hmm. Uh, I said, um, and I think actually Ryan will like this one. Hmm. I said, "Hey Ella, three conspiracy theorists walk into a bar. Now tell me that's a coincidence." <laughs> <laughs> that's good. <laughs> she just looked at me and kind of blinked twice. Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, if you want some custom videos from from me and Ryan celebrating something, you can. Uh, I think there's only about twenty or thirty slots left on that tier. No pressure. I'm not asking you to join it. We just wanted to put that information out there for you. It is available. And if you're one of the existing VIPs, thank you so much. That is available to you as well. Mm. Patreon.com slash The Minimalist Alabama. What else you got for us right now? Here are some voicemail comments and insights from our listeners. Hey, Josh and Ryan. Uh, my name is Zach Miller, calling from Minneapolis, Minnesota. Just uh, listened to your podcast. I, I'm not sure if it was on clothing or uh, travel or something like that, but you mentioned clothing, and I uh, just figured I'd share uh, what, what I've learned about uh, my clothing choices um, on my journey to becoming a minimalist. Um, my three objectives uh, for any sort of clothing item that I would own is that it is functional, uh, it is durable and uh, it is stylistic, stylistically versatile, uh, meaning I can wear it to any or most of the activities that I would partake in. Um, I generally stick to neutral or earth tones. This way it um, gets rid of the need for brands or logos and I can, again, pretty much wear it anywhere. Um, pop a color every once in a while with an outerwear, maybe a rain jacket uh, or a backpack or something like that um, helps to identify that it's yours as well, um, which is a useful function. Um, and again, mostly what I wear is geared towards function. Uh, what will I use it for? Can I use it for many different things, uh, whether it be professional business uh, or going on a hike? My name is Craig. I'm calling from the Toledo, Ohio area. And my comment is for Susan, who was wondering about keeping baby clothes uh, to remind her of when her newborn came home. This, I'm sure, will certainly expand into other projects and papers and artwork as the child progresses from preschool through kindergarten up to fourth, fifth grade, when most of that artwork is produced. We kept a lot of that stuff. Um, all of that sort of thing went into a big box because at the time when they're very young, that seems like very invaluable stuff to keep. And ultimately, as the children grew older, we started to sort through it and realized that only certain pieces meant something or that were had something that we really liked. And those were items that got scanned or photographed. And even now, uh, my children are 16 and 19. And as we still find various things, they kind of look at it and say, I don't know why you're keeping that. Uh, and so then we take a photograph of it and then it goes in the trash. So they don't seem to mind at all. And we keep remembrances of the pieces we like the best in a digital format and the rest of it goes away. So I guess what I'm saying is give yourself a little permission. Having a baby is a very exciting thing. And as they grow up, you will find more value in certain things than others and the things that you seem to want to hold on the most right now may not seem as important in a few years so give yourself a little a little time and a little uh availability to kind of hold on to stuff for a little while but not forever all right, y'all. I've been told that Jordan No More, who is manning all of our our cameras over here, he is uh, he has jumped into the live chat and he's been trolling us <laughs> during the live stream. So the patrons get uh, a little sample of that. I think the thing he just said in the in the live chat was, "Someday is the eighth day of the week." And it never arrives. <laughs> That's good, Jordan. You can that tweet good. that podcast, Sean. It is good. Man. Uh, by the way, Ryan, before we get into our added value segment this week, I'm going to turn all of y'all on to some new music that you're really going to enjoy. In fact, Danny has not stopped playing this album. Mm. Our our resident um, 
Gen Zer. They call them Zillennials, or is is Malabama a Zillennial? Um, no, she's Gen Y. I'm pretty sure. Wait, is Zillennial uh, like a cusper? Delenni- anyway, no. Uh, we'll get to the added value in a second. <laughs> I've got something from Patreon. This is we have a um. Well, a really quick testimonial from one of our lovely Patreon subscribers. Hannah said, I thoroughly enjoy listening to your private podcast. Your message of intentional living has had a tremendous impact on my my overall well-being and sense of peace. So much so that I had a dream the other night that I was about to die in a car crash. And instead of panicking, I called my cousin to tell him how much I loved him and how happy I am because I'm living more intentionally. Needless to say, I'm grateful to be a simpleton. Oh, wow. So we, uh, our, our patron supporters are uh, called simpletons. And uh, we, we've reclaimed the term, right? Because, well, we are all simpletons. Ryan and I are the king and queen simpleton. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll let you guess which one's the king and which one's the queen. <laughs> By the way, our, our Patreon is not just a some sort of bonus content where we throw up scraps and cutting room floor things. It's the other half of the show. So that every week we do two podcasts. <laughs> it's more like episodes. the other third, three quarters of the show. <laughs> yeah, that's true. <laughs> but we do two episodes every week. We do a minimal episode every Tuesday, maximal episode every Thursday. Thursday, so it's a free public episode, a private episode every every Thursday. And you can check that out at patreon.com slash the minimalists. Ryan, for added value this week. What do you got? There's a uh, hip hop artist named Gunna. Okay. We were listening to him a lot on tour. The uh, Oh yeah. Okay. The new album is DS4 Eva. And uh this song is called and I thought it was so appropriate for this episode. I've been saving it for a few weeks. This song is called Die Alone. And it opens up with this lyric. I don't want to be alone. I don't want to die alone. Mm. And quite often, isn't that what we're doing? When we're holding on to all of this stuff. Oh, I'm going to hold on to these things because I don't want to die alone. Mm. It's what Ram Das talks about when he says, you are encrusted with identity. Oh, And so we are all encrusted with this identity and our stuff becomes who we are. And we cling to those things because we are terrified of dying alone. Enjoy the song. By the way, we've got got a bunch more surprise questions this week. Like, what are 100 things that we would say to our 18-year-old selves, Ryan, about Mm. minimalism? Also, my kid is the kind that dumps bins to find what he wants at playtime. Do you have any simple tips? on the best practical way to store and organize his toys. What specifically do Joshua and Ryan do to set the stage in their homes every evening? Plus a million more questions for The Minimalists. And if you want to hear all that, check out The Minimalist private podcast. Visit patreon.com slash The Minimalist to subscribe and get your personal link so that our weekly private podcast plays in your favorite podcast app. You'll also gain access to hundreds of hours of private archives, recordings of live events, exclusive home tours, and our private community of thousands of open-minded minimizers like you. You can follow The Minimalist on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Minimalists. If you want our podcast show notes in your inbox, thanks to our good friend, Podcast Sean, he'll he'll send them right to you over at TheMinimalists.com. Just sign up for our email list over there. On behalf of Ryan Nicodemus, Podcast Sean, Malabama, Jordan No More, Social Jess, Danny Unknown, Emma the Immigrant, and the rest of our team. Did I say Jordan No More? I did you say did. It. Jordan No More. <laughs> no More. <laughs> I'm Joshua Fields Milvin, reminding you to love people and use things because the opposite never works. Thanks for being here, y'all. Thanks. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing you think that you need. Every little thing that's just feeding your greed. Oh, I bet that you'd be fine without it.